Um, this uh, presentation, it's a little bit, I, I wrote a book, Geology of the Book of Mormon, and I was looking, I think I'm the first geologist maybe that's been, uh, spoke at the BMAF, so uh, you may not know what a geologist is, it's just a, an archaeologist with no imagination. <laughs> so, and then I'm, all, I'm also an engineer, which basically just means I didn't have enough personality to be an accountant. So, <laughs> so the presentation here is a little bit kind of sections of the book. The book is for sale, but I mean, if you want it, it's free on a website, and I'll give it to you in PDF format. Um, I just decided I'm not really, it was not really one of the Book of Mormon crowd, really. I'd always followed things, and, but a few years ago, I just decided I need to start using my skills, whatever skills they are, to look at Book of Mormon. I have kids that have struggled uh, with different elements of things, so it motivated me to say, hey, maybe I need to bring some skills I have to bear, and the geology book was probably my first product. So, um, the, it, It's not a new thing, uh, so nothing new to know that there's been discussions of the volcanic eruption in Third Nephi, um, that explaining all the events. Uh, obviously, there were earthquakes, so we know there are some geologic events. So, the purpose of this book was actually to take those and try to apply them on the ground. Um, so, the scope was to, and this is limited. The book had a few more sections, but is to provide um, an explanation for all the geological events, not just some. Um, like I said, go beyond the general concepts to on-the-ground application in Mesoamerica. And then uh, part of it was, the concept was, I'm not going to necessarily favor any particular model, but I needed a model to compare it against. So the Sorensen model uh, is kind of the most developed, you would say, in terms of maps and all those types of things, and, and where I could actually take a long, longitude latitude and zap it in. So. Uh, it's, uh, there are other models and they can apply similar principles to them. Uh, I'm going to go through a little bit of Geology 101 just so to kind of give you a background. Uh, geology, uh, one of the premises of geology uh, is that you have different crustal plates that uh, move. You've got a spreading center where you have crustal material that is generated. You have a subduction zone where it's dives underneath another plate. Um, the, the reason I'm talking about this is because the isthmus of Tehuantepec is a little bit complicated <laughs> in this regard. Um, the, this is the isthmus of Tehuantepec, and what you have is a, the Cocos Plate is going underneath two plates, the North American plate and the Caribbean plate. So you have a subduction zone. On the back side, uh, on a subduction zone, you will generate volcanic activity off of the subduction zone. As the plate is, is subducted underneath the other plate, you get molten, lighter material that comes up and forms volcanic arcs. So uh, what we have here is some uh, volcanic arcs here, which means there's a series or a few volcanoes in each of those arcs. So that's, um, and, and again, the attempt here is, okay, we, we know we've got a volcano, we know we've got earthquakes, let's see if we can figure out, get some good possibilities of which volcano it might be, um, which fault system it might be. So in the isthmus area, you have these three plates, as I mentioned, this plate is going underneath uh, here in a subduction zone. The North American plate and the Caribbean plate are actually moving, but they're kind of rotating or moving side, sideways, not underneath. They're kind of sliding against each other or rotating against each other. And what that causes is you have a strike-slip fault system, and I'll talk about that, um, that comes up through here that is related to the uh, plate boundaries. So, in the isthmus, this is a little dots are all the earthquakes um, 
that have been recorded recently above a certain size. And as you can see, along this subduction zone, you get a lot of earthquake activity. Um, you also have earthquake activity along your strike slip. So that's important because then you say, okay, now we, we kind of know at least a couple, there's two places that you might look for for significant earthquake activity in the Isthmus of Tehuantepec. And this is just the Sorensen model map. Those many have already seen it probably, but just letting you know that the, you, know, you have the land northward here and your Veracruz fault systems there, land southward here, and you've got the other portions, uh, the Matoga system, which is, is really just an offset of the Veracruz system. Um, when you look at, there's an analysis geologists do, uh, for example, if you have a, a volcano that you know has had activity and you're trying to determine hazards for the community, you actually will look at that volcano, try to generate uh, whatever history you can find from it uh, and see what kind of hazards that you might coming, come off the volcano when it erupts. And so urban planners use that and say, okay, we need to, you know, Mexico City, you don't want to build in this area or um, there's maybe a low area where a lahar might go through. And so this is just the potential hazards that you would expect off of a, uh, a volcano. And the reason I'm talking about this is we're going to have to apply this to the cities that were destroyed and see what we can figure out uh, from those hazards. And you've got pyroclastic and surge flows, debris slides, lahars. A lahar is a, um, it's a mud flow. What happens is, is you get uh, oops, you get, uh, if you have a snow cap volcano, when it erupts, the snow immediately melts, and so it turns to mud. You can also have a volcano that has a high groundwater, where you've got a high water table that it will turn it to mud. Um, you can also, they have primary and secondary lahars. You can have, uh, the eruption itself will generate precipitation, which then can also cause mud flows. And so that's what a lahar is. Another hazard, you've got the ash flow itself, uh, volcanic earthquakes, which we'll talk about in a minute. I did a, there's an analysis on this because there's a question uh, whether a volcanic earthquake could actually generate the kind of uh, destruction that is described in Third Nephi. Uh, you can get a tsunami off of a volcano if it's located near a water body in the ocean, for example. Uh, lava flows, well, the lava flows aren't really, they typically don't move fast enough most people could outrun them. Um, they cause property damage, but may not have really been at play much in the third Nephi description. And then another hazard is the volcanic lightning and thunder that um, gets generated. So this is your pyroclastic event. I don't know who's in that Jeep, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they're about 90 miles an hour as fast as they can get down. Um, Probably some crazy geologist, but <laughs> and so these events are are they're fast, they're hot, superheated material. They kill immediately. Here's a lahar flow um, that came off a volcano, just mud. The lahars can go quite a distance from the volcano. You have the volcano up here with the steam coming off of it, and this is the river that's full of this material, that's a, a bridge, well, was a bridge. And, and so some of these events can actually extend some distance from the volcano. Uh, Book of Mormon talks about, Third Nephi event talks about whirlwinds. Um, these are whirlwinds following a pyroclastic flow. If pyroclastic flow has just gone through here, these are whirlwinds that are generated. The, these ones probably are not the ones, not the type that they were talking about in terms of uh, speed and power, because it talked about losing people and that to the whirlwinds. But volcanoes can generate very high-powered uh, whirlwinds. Uh, you know, Mormon wrote, well, or at least the record that he was citing or amending or um, uh, putting together, talked about exceedingly sharp lightning, and volcanoes definitely qualify in the, with that description, as you can see. Because you get a, you've got, imagine you've got this ash cloud generating all kinds of static electricity, so that's, what's, that's where your lightning comes off of 
volcano. Now, earthquake hazard, there are three kinds of earthquakes. You have or fault systems that generate earthquakes, a reverse fault, where this block moves up and hangs over. Those occur in compression situations where things are being smushed. Uh, a normal fault is where you have this dropping or, or up, uh, up block. Those are typically in a tension environment where it's pulling apart. And, it, and then you've got a strike slip, kind of like your California, most of you, that's probably why you live here. But uh, uh, that's, that's what, uh, there are other reasons, but. <laughs> and, and so you get the, 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 you don't get very much vertical displacement necessarily. Uh, I, I have this on here because the Book of Mormon talks about severe fracturing and in the seams of the earth, all kinds of language that way. And the strike slip fall is typical that way. You get all kinds of fracture patterns, um, whereas your, your normal fall, you, you, get, you get some fractures, but they're more just up, down, and cracks kind of thing uh, along a, a face where the, the strike, strike slip generates all these horsetails and different things off of it. Most people don't realize, but the strike slip also can generate subsidence, dropping and raising, which that's also talked about in the Book of Mormon where it says sunk. I mean, I'm interpreting that there to mean that they actually kind of knew that it went down. It just wasn't some generic thing uh, that things were sinking. I mean, they, that the city actually sunk. So that will tell me something about um, that city. The other thing that happens in earthquakes is you get what's called lateral spreading or liquefaction. Um, so you have your earthquake zone where your fault actually uh, happens, but when, a, when an earthquake occurs, you get pressure waves and surface waves that come off of the fault, like this, and they also have pressure waves. It's just like if you had a line of ping pong balls, you punch one ping pong ball, the other one hits the other one, so it's kind of this wave that runs through. That's called a pressure wave. And what happens is you have materials, soils that are saturated, other things that aren't necessarily right on the fault, um, like here down in... Um, near the lake that are saturated soils, you can actually get more damage because what happens is that, that pressure wave hits and it turns it to jello, essentially your soil to jello. So it has no uh, bearing strength. And so you get cracking where there's slopes, you get buildings that shift because it's just like on jello. And that may have been a factor too in the Book of Mormon. So I had to look at that when I'm looking at the Isthmus of Tuonapeg. Um, what you have to do in a situation like uh, an ancient event is you have to say, okay, I don't have a, there's not, uh, there wasn't a seismograph available, <laughs> so, so I don't have somebody measuring uh, an earthquake, how powerful an earthquake was. So I have to use a description of damage in the earthquake to kind of back determine what uh, power that earthquake was. And there's what's called the Mercalli scale. Um, and this is kind of comparing it to the Richter scale, where they've actually said, okay, if it's this uh, size of an earthquake, it's a one, two, three, four, five, up to the most powerful um, uh, earthquake there at a 12, this Roman numeral 12. And the other thing I did, it's in the book, it, I can't really go through everything because it was quite um, extensive, is I took the entire event and uh, extracted and classified the hazard type, location, characteristics, and the time frame, because the time frame actually has some importance too as to what type of event you may have been looking at. And I also did the prophecies, uh, assuming that they saw something, uh, recognizing that it may not be exact chronological, you know, when they're seeing a vision of an event, it may, you know, there may be some interpretation there, but I said those are actual I've treated those as actual reports, even though most people would say, well, that, you know, geologists wouldn't consider that a report, but, but if you subscribe to the Book of Mormon, that were, there was somebody seeing something. So, uh, and then I had to go through and get the disaster timelines, carefully go through the Book of Mormon to get our uh, disaster timelines so I could, you know, lay out, uh, help us, tell us what was happening. And have Christ dies, that's when, of course, the, the event starts. And I, it, it really doesn't matter which one of these days, dates, uh, in geologic time frames, one year doesn't even show up on as a blip when you're talking, you know. And radiometric dating, you can't get that accurate, really, even for modern stuff. So, but 
the reason it is important is because of season. Because I'm going to, one thing I wanted to look at was the, the possibility that the Great Storm was a hurricane. So I did some, this isn't only geology, I also did some, um, you know, Channel 5 weatherman stuff uh, research. But, uh, so immediately after the Great Storm arose, um, it lasted roughly three hours. Some of the destructive forces occurred intermittently throughout the three hours, others continuously, if you read it closely. Uh, after the storm and other destructive forces ceased, there was a darkness upon the face of the land for three days. Then it has many hours before the end of the three days, a summary of the destruction of the various cities was provided by the voice of Jesus Christ. The many hours, there is, there's, there's a little bit of interpolation there. We know uh, from another reference in the Book of Mormon that it talks about, I think when he was talking to the Lamanite king, as it said the time as they, you know, an hour as they measured it or whatever. So I, I, I'm not, I'm, I don't think we know exactly that it's a 24-hour day. Um, Hebrew had different ones, but I just assumed that and said, okay, I, I don't really know, but maybe I can use that, and it's probably not too far off. And then this is the thing that a lot of people have kind of missed about that event. They, they don't, there's just one scripture that talks about it. It says, during the three-day period, you still had some continuing events um, after your initial three-hour event that were occurring, and you had trembling of the earth, rending of the rocks, dreadful groanings, and tumultuous noises. So there were some things going on. You had the darkness, the three days darkness, but that wasn't the only thing. For the hurricane analysis, what I did is I went back and got all of the, earth, uh, the hurricane events that had occurred um, since 1842, and these are all plotted in wonderfully, so many that you can't tell what is going on. But, uh, and there's some tropical storms there. Because I was trying to say, OK, if this, we need to say, it, it was, is it a possibility that we have a hurricane event here or not? And most of my approach is that I'm not actually proving anything, but it's kind of a best fit, uh, looks to be the most you know, li likely situation. So I looked at all those. There's not, and I looked at the seasonality of them. And 90% uh, of the hurricanes that have gone through, and this is really not unique to this area, just anywhere in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, you had only eight tropical storms or hurricanes uh, of the 2,580 occurred before May. Now remember, we had April or March, late March, early April as the date of Christ's death. So that would tell you it's probably not that likely. Should I take questions or? Can I just ask a question sure. now? Sure. Yeah. I don't see any mention of rain in the destruction of the third Nephi. So wouldn't that tend to exclude the hurricane possibility? And talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> that that's the other thing. It says a storm, and I actually in the book I go into great detail. And say what is a storm? Looking at Royal Scows and uh, early uh, modern English, and Kirk can tell you all about that if you ever want. To. He's the he's the guy that knows a lot. And, and, and so I looked at that, and it could, the definition could, by implication, include uh, precipitation, meaning the storm, you could have just said storm, and that implied precipitation, but also perhaps not. There were some definitions that said it was lacked rain. So I, I couldn't get anything out of that actual language when I looked at it. The reason they couldn't ignite their exceedingly dry wood wasn't because it was wet, because of those mists of darkness. And, and, I, and I, yeah, I says that was another thing that in prior, and let me say, Dr. Qualis actually did an article that was very good that I recommend you all read in BYU Studies, where he went through a lot of those details. That was one difference, I, I agree with you, is that it's, it's really talking about, I, I mean, they knew how, in a tropical environment, they knew how to keep wood dry. And so what it's, I think it's representing, it's just saying, hey, we couldn't even light our driest wood. That's how you know, smothering this vapor of darkness uh, was. The other thing, um, the other issue is, can you get a dry hurricane? Yes, and, and they, meaning you could have one hit that was dry on the front, but uh, those tend to be uh, very fast hurricanes. And that was the other thing I looked at is, what is the average speed of a hurricane? And could it traverse this area in a three-hour period? Uh, you could get um, uh, a very fast-moving one, but what happens is those are not very powerful hurricanes. As you recall, when a hurricane sits over warm water, that's what 
that's what gives all the energy into the system as it, you know, that's why once they hit land, they dissipate because they're not getting all that, that energy. <laughs> and so the question is, and the other question I ask is, is there something in the Book of Mormon, Third Nephi destruction description that requires a hurricane? I mean, is there something there that is unique that couldn't be explained by other factors? And the answer is that all the hazards can be accounted for without a hurricane. Now, I'm not concluding for sure there was no hurricane, there was not some kind of hurricane, but I'm just saying it's not necessarily a requirement um, of the description uh, of the event. Uh, the other the other question was, as I mentioned, is, uh, and again, I'm looking at each of these and saying, are they exclusive or not exclusive? So you have, could a volcanic eruption explain all elements of the destruction? One issue that really has never been talked about is that, oops, excuse me, that all the volcanic, all volcanic earthquakes are really not very powerful. Uh, the largest ever recorded was a magnitude seven, uh, which, and it only propagates a few miles from the volcano. So I'm not saying there couldn't have been some damage from the volcano, but, but those are not, you need a lot more powerful earthquake to have collapsing of cities and ex especially extensive damage in the land northward like it's talking about. Um, there's an equation that a Russian scientist has, which you'll want to write this down for future <laughs> reference, <laughs> where, you can, we, where I've actually used that to calculate the intensity on the modified Mercalli scale, um, you can get to the Mercalli scale. Now you're starting to say, well, now it's time to go to sleep. But, um, and, and so I can, I can actually convert the power, earthquake power of a seven into an intensity, which is the shaking that, I, that we actually, that we use that Mercalli scale where it's a descriptive damage scale, not a seismographic or measured scale. It's more based on the type of damage. And, uh, and so I says, okay, and the book has a lot more of these. Just for an example, I don't have a volcan volcano erupting, but I say, let's just lay in uh, a seven uh, magnitude earthquake into uh, somewhere, and, and these are actual earthquakes. And what these are called are shake maps. The um, um, US Geologic Service, when there's an earthquake, they actually generate these based on the shaking that's happening. And so they map them. Here on the bottom is the Mercalli scale. Uh, you have to, ha what we're looking for, you can see that the damage here, you, you, you don't even get up into these higher levels of damage on any of these. Um, these, these are lower level where, you, you know, pots are rattling or something like that. So it's just showing that pr the probability of a volcano generating an earth, a volcano alone does, does not look to be able to generate the type of energy you need and, and destructive capacity um, to, to account for the third Nephi events. So the descriptive type of damage requires both a volcanic eruption and a regional earthquake. That's one thing I'm asserting. Um, so then the second question comes is, okay, we have a three hour time, something happened fast, you have a three hour time frame. So can you get um, a simultaneous or close to simultaneous volcanic eruption and a regional earthquake? And the answer is yes, they do occur. And there are certain parameters that they typically occur under. And that will, may also help us tell in the Isthmus of Tehuantepec where the vol which volcano it might be. So only one I'm going to talk about that. <laughs> I, 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 it, it may be more, and that's uh, and I'm not limiting, but I'm just saying that and again, I'd like to say, there's some, of the, some of the conclusions I have are, are kind of best fit, meaning there may be some other explanation that's farther, you know, not so likely. So, and that's what we, when you do a hazard analysis, that's the best you can do. And so the volcanic eruption, th this was a study that was done looking at all these events where you have pretty much simultaneous earthquakes and volcanic eruptions by Egger and Walter. And they basically determined volcanic eruptions can be triggered within seconds of an earthquake event. Most act, mostly when it happens, it occurs on the same day as the earthquake, meaning it doesn't like erupt and then four days later, it usually is within a day when you have. Um, and the highest correlation of earthquakes triggering volcanic eruption is around the Pacific Ring of Fire, which that qualifies. The Pacific Ring of Fire is, is uh, the subduction zones typically all around the Pacific 
of which the Isthmus of Tehuantepec is part of that. Uh, the most common events occur when the earthquake is near the volcano. And then before the earthquake, there's less regional volcanic activity in the years leading up to the earthquake. After an earthquake, there's more regional volcanic activity. In the book, I actually did look at that. At I looked through every single volcano in the entire Isthmus of Tehuantepec. All the data I could gather, it was not a small job, and, and kind of evaluated that in the book. And it does look like that is actually probably the case, that there was kind of a, a lapse in volcanic activity before the third Nephite event from what I could get from the data. Uh, again, take notes here. <laughs> So one question I've got to answer is, which of the regional uh, systems that I showed you, you had kind of the subduction zone system, you had that strike slip fault system, the Veracruz fault system. So I've, I've really only got two that look like they could generate, you know, it's a regional earthquake system. So which one is the most likely event uh, for the third Nephi event? These equations, what you have is when you have an earthquake, we call it attenuation modeling. You have the earthquake, but then you have damage a certain distance off of the earthquake. And the calculation of the damage, there's a lot of parameters that uh, control that. You have cer certain type of rock type, a certain type of, of soil material. So it's a unique um, equation depending on where you're at in the world. So, you know, it's the San Francisco uh, section of the fault may actually have different attenuation factors than, because it's got different surrounding material. So uh, what I did is there, there wasn't a great, uh, it, it, to develop these equations takes a lot of money. They, they, they monitor, they have all these monitors, the earthquake happens and they generate the, these equations and millions and millions of dollars. Uh, if you've been down to the Isthmus of Tehuantepec, it's pretty clear if they're gonna spend a million dollars, it's probably not an earthquake. <laughs> attenuation modeling, they've got other issues. So, but, but there was uh, a couple of a, a study that I did find that was a little further to the north and that was done because of the Mexico City where they actually, and so I had to kind of apply some <laughs> factors as close as I could, some equations as close as I could uh, to give, to kind of model these, um, what you might expect off of the fault. So this one, I've assumed kind of a, a, a worst case type of a very powerful earthquake and said, okay, uh, an 11 intensity is the, uh, it's not the very highest on the Mercalli, but almost. So I said, okay, let's say you had uh, that type of an event along the Veracruz Fault or along the subduction zone. Uh, what would you, where would you get damage out to seven, which seven, uh, you're probably looking at above a seven on the intensity scale to describe the damage in the third Nephi event. So you lay this in, there you go, that's where, that's the area you might get damaged. Now I didn't put the fault in down here, that could also be managed, but I'm going off the Sorensen model, remember, and actually most Mesoamerican models, someone who's a mo uh, geographic model expert could tell me, but most of them have the land northward here, and so, uh, I didn't really go down into here because the land southward said there was great damage, but the, all it says the greatest damage is in the land northward. You had the presumption is, and I did an analysis on the city names being Jaredite derived that were mentioned that were specifically damaged, and so it does look like you are looking at a, a land northward is is where you're getting most of it. And as you can see, well, you could have uh, earthquake, but your, your zone you just don't get enough off off the subduction zone. And they tend to be deep earthquakes too because you don't. You don't only attenuate horizontally. If it's deep, it also loses power as it comes up through the material. So when you get deep earthquakes, they don't generate very much on necessarily very much on the surface. So that looked to be, hey, I've got a pretty good fit here. You've got a regional earthquake system. It's a strike slip system that's sitting in the right location. Okay, so I think I've got the regional fault system figured out. Uh, for then I said, okay, now I got to go to the volcano question. First question, can you have multiple, and maybe I've got that here, but maybe we'll get, if I get there and we've already talked about it, can you have multiple volcanic eruptions occur at the same time? The answer is yes. The Kamchatka Peninsula, that's occurred. Uh, so it can occur. Best fit would be, 
can I explain it with only one? That might be something to look at. Not saying that there weren't more, but that might be a good, um, let's, we'll take a look at it. So I mean, I looked, again, I looked at every volcano, so it wasn't like I just zeroed in on one. I looked at them all to say, okay, which ones have eruptions during the proper time frames? And um, the bet you have kind of the land northward, you have San Martin, Pico de Orizaba, and Pablo Catapetal, I mean, I probably didn't pronounce that right. With, they speak Italian, but not Mayan or Spanish, so. Uh, in the central part of the isthmus, there's, again, the San Martin and the El Chicon, which not erupted in 82. And then the question is, okay, what's the relationship between the regional fault system and any of these volcanoes? Well, the San Martin volcano actually sits on the Veracruz fault system. In fact, the volcano itself, the structure of the volcano itself is dictated by the fault. So you actually have uh, the magmatic, uh, the volcanic uh, deposits and eruptions occurring kind of along linear features of the fault. So they're, they're intricately related. So that was one of the best fit parameters was that your earthquake be close to the volcano, and in this situation, it's right on. So, okay, the San Martin, I'm not saying it wasn't those others, and, but that seems to be the one that actually matches that criteria. Um, I, I'm saying it's the best candidate. I'm not saying it's the only possibility, but I, I, I would assert that this one at least erupted. The other ones might have too. Um, and because it, it, it meets all the requirements. Uh, is in the land northward, but centrally located which could help you account for the vapor of darkness covering both the land northward and the land southward. So if you had Pico de Orizaba, which is further north, the other one is located around Mexico City, you'd have to have uh, a quite a distance covered to get into the land southward, because that was also covered. And so a centrally located volcano uh, will, will give you, will meet the requirement of third Nephi. The other thing about the San Martin, Volcano. It's a phreatomagmatic volcano, which don't write that down. But what that means is it is a noisy volcano. I mean, it has explosions, multiple explosions. And one thing I did is I, I got a, a recounting of the uh, 1793 eruption of this volcano, and I translated it. And it was kind of interesting because it actually started erupting while there was a thunderstorm over the volcano, so it was kind of covered with clouds. So they thought it was a storm, a huge storm, when it started erupting. Uh, doesn't, I'm just saying. <laughs> so, and, and then it was, there were over 400 explosions were happened overnight. And so the, the, it was during the time the Spanish were there, there were people running down, volunteering. They thought it was, that Veracruz was under attack by pirates. So it sounded, well, like cannon fire, third Nephi, how many cannons are in Mesoamerica, Kirk, can you tell me? <laughs> so they didn't describe it as an explosion, but what do they describe it as probably? Tumultuous noises. And actually other places in the Book of Mormon, you have tumultuous noises in scenes of battle. They actually use that term. So, so I think that's actually, they were trying to describe the best they could of what was going on. Um, like I said, it's located directly on the fault system. Am I running out of time, or how much time have I got? I don't know, but um, the, uh, this is a picture of the, the volcano. Very peaceful. <laughs> and the other thing I try to do is I say, okay, I'm gonna take the 1793 eruption and see where I can track the ash deposits um, off of that 1793 based on the description there's a, a, a naturalist that was sent over from Spain and he kind of did a recounting of it. So I used that and then there was actually a, uh, uh, some drill, core drills right here uh, that had showed ash from that deposit is in some uh, sediment deposits. And so I just laid it in and said, okay, it happened all over here, just drew an ellipse and says, okay, you're, you're extensive from that eruption, which wasn't maybe the most powerful you got a pretty broad extension of ash. Does it completely cover what a lot of people are saying land southward? Well, no, but you'd probably say it's most of land northward. 
Of course, this would be dependent upon local meteorological con conditions at the time that move the ash and blow the ash. But so I'm saying, I think that, for that eruption showed that you that would make sense if that was the volcano. Now, um, and then the other thing is you've got this level of zone three, uh, level three damage within the level two intensity earthquake. One thing I needed to look at, additional thing I needed to look at, and get part of what I'm trying to do is get the geography scoped in because that may help us in looking at cities and things. And also, if I'm going to test the Sorensen model, I've got to be able to throw it in and into wherever he says a city is and see if it falls within these specific areas. Um, so I had to look at uh, this lateral liquefaction factor that I talked about where you have, and, I, and there was not any map, so I had to generate this map and I took it based on other geologic maps. I used some San Francisco studies uh, uh, based on soil type. And what this kind of says, basically says is certain, in certain areas, it will, it will jump up the intensity point, two points on the Mercalli scale if there's an earthquake in that area. So it just gives me a little better saying, okay, there are some other areas that may have had more damage than outside that other zone. So a summary of the best fit uh, for all events and locations described at this point is your, dar your darkness and vapor is a volcanic ash, gas and ash dispersion, great quakings and tremblings or regional earthquake, and the aftershocks. Remember, it went three days, and it was talking about quaking, so, and the rumblings and tumultuous noises. So it looks like you have, you have three days of a volcanic eruption generating the ash cloud. You also had some aftershocks um, occurring. So it, it actually matches the scenario, the hazard scenario that we were looking at. Uh, you've got these other, uh, Xander, when do I need to finish up here? Because about 15 minutes. Okay. So then I said, okay, um, let's take the actual locations that Sorensen has indicated, see whether I can fit them with the city, destruction of the city that we're talking about in the third Nephi event. Uh, Moroni Ha said the earthquake triggered uh, in the last, the text indicates it was in the land south, where Sorensen kind of tried to locate it based on where he thought the, the most battles that were done by Moroniha were, but he didn't really use any geographic parameters. So that was a soft one that he said, I'm not quite sure. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll look at it and say, I don't, that's not really, I'm not gonna hold you to that, but let's see if I can find a place where you um, might get the place of the city there became a great mountain. That's always been a curious description. So which actually had happened in 2007 on the Grijalva River was one of the largest land movements recorded. You had a landslide that came into the river, generated this huge mountain in the river, um, kind of like the Thistle Slide. I mean, not this is way bigger than the Thistle Slide, if you guys are old enough to remember. Thistle Slide of 82 blocked the Spanish Fork River. And, yeah, I mean, they, and so what happens, you have, a, a, and these types of things actually reoccur in the same areas. Because what happens is the movement, the, the material slips down here off the side of the mountain on some zone of, of slippage, but it won't slip any, this other material won't move because it's kind of pushed up against the material that's already moved. But over time, this will erode out of the river. And then once this is gone, then it can tend to slip again in, in some other kind of earthquake event. So I said, okay, you've got a pretty good um, description uh, among a few others, which I didn't have time for for the Moroniha event. That's why I was, one of my goals was to say, okay, can you get a great mountain uh, generated in the zone that you need it to? And you could. The other thing is um, city of Gilgal. Some of these I just can say, okay, it's somewhere within the zone. That's all we can really say. And so you would say the best for, for city of, of Gilgal was going to be within the earthquake zone. The city of Jacob Ugath, Lehman, Josh Gad, and Kishkumen locations, it says send down fire to destroy them, cause to be burned with fire, to cause them to be burned. The, the down fire, it's described differently than Zarahemla, which took fire. So it sounds like you have some sort of fire coming down. Uh, there's really no good studies on um, how much, what will light on fire a certain distance away from a volcano. I use the Krakatoa um, it, it just use that. They, they did report, you know, people's clothes catching on fire up to 70 kilometers away. So I said, okay, just draw that in. 
around these volcanoes. Like I said, I don't presume that there's only one. And so you say, okay, you probably have those cities located somewhere within that, within that zone. Which again, I'm only trying to, I'm not gonna pinpoint a city, but at least I can, it's more than we've got so far. Um, these were sunk and made hills and valleys and places thereof, uh, being buried up in the depths of the earth. Again, they require that they be within proximity of the fault to account for subsidence, subsidence, you can say that the other way. And the hills and valleys, uh, I believe, that, that was a unique description too, that they, don't, they only gave to those particular cities. And you have, actually scientists didn't really realize this till the Mount St. Helens, is you get these pyroclastic flows and they leave these hills and valleys. So I think what you're talking about there, that, that actually describes um, probably what was left after a pyroclastic flow. So you could then interpolate those cities probably were within some proximity of the volcano as well. Um, these other, I'm not gonna spend much time, but these, these were, waters came up in the stead thereof. These cities were buried with water. Um, I think we'll just kind of skip through that. There, 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 I, 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 could, I could tell you a geographic type of location, but not a specific. That one kind of works with, with potted land. If you've got a landslide that blocks a river and makes the lake a lot deeper, then you bury the city. Yeah, and I, I actually am got some, I've got a couple of geologists. We're going to go down to Atitlan. Uh, it could be a lot of things. Um, there was a, the, the difference in Atitlan, there is not a river that flows out of Atitlan. But if it's already a lake, it suddenly gets deeper. Yeah, so there, you could have a base volcanic event. There was a volcanic, that's what we're going down to determine. There was a volcanic eruption. You have Samabaj, which is buried beneath the waters of the lake. We probably need to try to date, see if we can get radiometric dates on the volcanic eruption, see whether that's consistent with a third D5 event. There are other things that could happen. I've got all the seismic data on Lake Atitlan. It took me a long time to get out of the USGS. There are some other possibilities. You have, I actually talked to the scientist that did that, who's down at Scripps, and he said, there's a large amount of gas trapped in the sediments of Atitlan. And if you have an earthquake event, it can release those gases. It's just like a, a seltzer thing where, where you could have had that. There's, just a, there's a lot of other possibilities. Moroni, the city of Moroni uh, was the one that went into the sea. Sorensen had it here. It's outside of the zone where you, uh, that I had modeled with the attenuation, but it actually, if you lay in the um, additional um, uh, lateral spreading and liquefaction um, map that I had, it actually will fall within the, the zone. So I would say, I'm not saying that's the location where I'm just saying that's where Sorensen's location actually has geologic parameters that fit. Um, and th that same exact thing happened in the city of Port, Port Royal in Jamaica. Uh, it sunk into the ocean due to liquefaction event caused by an earthquake in 1692. It's kind of funny because this was a pirate city, um, very loose and sinful, and they actually said this was an act of God, that earthquake sunk that city, <laughs> all, all the Puritan and Christians at the time. So I thought, okay, you know, we're not the only ones <laughs> with that concept. Oops, what did I do here? And then I kind of looked and said, "There's, you could have had a, also a tsunami event uh, where Sorensen had it. Uh, you have a, here's a tidal surge that occurred uh, during Hurricane Isabel. Here was a, uh, you had a, a beach, barrier beach island. Here's what happened to it, here's afterwards. So you could have water moving in and out. That could also, it did say that Moroni sunk, so you would have to have an elevation drop to technically meet that requirement. City of Zarahemla took fire. So I said, okay, um, here's the reasons that could have happened. Earthquake induced upset of some fire source. Um, you'd have to get a level four probably to do that. It fits. Um, uh, land of Nephi, oh, okay. So that's the, um, the third Nephi event. I think it's pretty well explained. All the parameters are explained. The, uh, the, the goal was to try to get some geographic limitations where those cities are. I think I did that. Uh, I looked at a couple other events, the Land of Nephi volcanic event. Uh, and I basically said, okay, you've got, and this was the valley of the, uh, uh, in Guatemala that um, Neil talked about. So 
uh, and I went through the event, here's what's <laughs> happening. You have some multiple earthquakes, overshadowing cloud of darkness, then the cloud of darkness dissipated. If you talk about the intensity, it meets in Mercalli level four or five. Um, Sorensen had that event, Guatemala City. So I said, okay, here is the Guatemala City um, uh, using the Zobin equation, which you all wrote down and we'll recite afterward. Uh, I could use that to calculate what, I back calculated distance from active volcano. This was actually an event that, uh, a model of that volcano that occurred. And it actually matched, meaning if you back calculate it, it gives you the range of magnitude you would expect off a volcanic uh, earthquake. So that fit. The Ammoniah uh, event, um, the way they described it, a level eight earthquake, uh, they had this unusual great noise, which uh, Kirk and me have argued about, uh, a great noise. So, <laughs> and the phenomenon, there's a phenomenon most people aren't aware of that's called an earthquake boom. It's, uh, you can get sonic booms off of certain types of earthquakes. Yeah, yeah, and so they're, they're called super shear. They only occur in, typically in certain environments. Um, and so I said, okay, the parameters that that, that can occur, laying in um, what Sorensen had, it had to have it be in a strike slip zone. It does, it was supposed to be underlain by granite or occur in a granite, actually that is a metagranite under here, so that extends underneath, so you actually have the conditions, I mean, super sure what could occur there. So finally, what's accomplished by this effort, other than a, a wonderful speech at the BMAF conference, is uh, geologic, uh, geologic criteria have been established for evaluating all of the Book of Mormon geographic models, so people can use my book, my reference, anywhere in Mesoamerica, um, and say, okay, here's my model. Does it meet, you know, throw in this geological information, look at my cities, does that match? Does it, does it match the, the geologic parameter? Um, we've established certain basic criteria. Um, you've got to have an active volcano and a regional earthquake in the land northward. I just, don't, there's really no other way you can explain that. I'm not saying which models that eliminates. You can well imagine. Um, <laughs> There's not too many volcanoes outside of um, the Great Lakes area. So, <laughs> uh, the, the other thing is in the Baja. There's some people Baja that need to look at that because when I looked at Baja, there didn't seem to be a volcano that had that was eruptive. They were all too old. There were not any new volcanoes. So, again, you'd say you need to apply that to your model and see what it works. And I'm, again, I, I was when I started, I wasn't even aware of any of the model fighting that goes on <laughs> the Book of Mormon. I was just trying to <laughs> use my science and try to apply it. So um, I've got reasonable explanations for all the physical events wrapped in the Third Nephi catastrophe and all prophetic descriptions. So we have a complete, I mean, they can all be explained. And um, even the tumultuous noises, great mountain, things that you'd say, well, that's a little puzzling language. But actually, you can't, you get great mountain, just like they described it. Um, I, I think I've defined areas for Book of Mormon cities whose location was previously considered unknown, um, and I've listed those here. Some, at, like Onaha and Mokum, those again were ones that were covered with water. I can't really tell you where, but at least in the book you can see there's only certain geographical types of scenarios. Uh, it's got to be within certain distance. Uh, you could have a blocked river, so it doesn't tell you where it is, but it, you, can, you can lay it in and say, well, it's not there because it doesn't have fit that geograph geographic um, setting. And then uh, another goal was to analyze what the Book of Mormon actually said. And I'm not going to go through all this because I'm kind of running out of time. And then finally, I've got some other books that are free. Um, if you want serious, boring reading, the Ziff Magic Goggles and Golden Plates. <laughs> if you want exciting reading that people are beating me up for, Try the translation of the character's document. So, um, and my books are all available for free uh, electronically uh, at this website. So, um, anyway, I guess I don't know if any questions. Uh oh. Have you located Atlantis? No, that's not a question. <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.
That's the next book. <laughs> okay, Heartland Center that the Bergamot earthquake volcanic activity occurred in North America. Is there any geologic evidence that that could have happened? I, I actually, there, there are volcanoes in North America, but they're all west, Washington, Oregon. Um, so if you've got a model that shows that, that doesn't, the Heartland doesn't show that. The earthquake, there is the new Madrid, uh, Madrid Fault, which you could, that, that does have significant earthquakes, so you could look at that um, as a possibility. Of course, the western part of the United States has lots of faults and, and regional earthquakes. So, so I, I'm not saying that the Heartland model meets that. Someone just needs to lay that in and see whether, that was a part of the problem. I kind of looked at, someone said to look at Heartland, and I couldn't get very specific cities and maps and things that were specific enough that I could lay in a city and say it's right here. It's kind of like, well, somewhere in this area. So I did kind of look at that. Um, what side is the PDF of your book? Uh, there you go. Uh, what geological forces um, uh, resulted in the formation of the Kuchamatak? Uh, I can't read. I should have brought my glasses. But uh, Mountains, th those are the ones, correct me if I'm wrong, that are in the slant southward. Guatemala. Yeah, Guatemala. Like I said, you actually, there's a lot of complicated things. You have the subduction zone, so you got volcanic activity, accretion of, uh, but I, I'd have to look and see on the geologic maps whether they are volcanic, if there's volcanic deposits there. If not, what you have is there's still crustal material there. You've got a plate that's going underneath. So you have formations just like here that are millions and millions of years old. Uh, and, and when they get under, they also move up, just like our faults move up and down. So I, I, that's a good question. I just don't know. Can you comment on the 30-day discussion of the inability to light fire? I uh, probably should have talked about that. The volcanic ash in, in reports of uh, historic reports, ancient reports of volcanic erupt eruptions, that has been something that they reported. And also, in the 1793 eruption of San Martin, they said they had, could not generate uh, artificial fire. They couldn't light. Fire. So it, it doesn't happen in every volcanic eruption, but if it's thick enough, you have, and it's probably not that you couldn't light anywhere, but just it's so thick you, you really can't light fire. You can't see anything. Yeah, you also have some gases locally that could snuff out your fires. So that, I mean, that explanation fits. How did you arrive at the specific dates for this event, the death of the Savior? Um, I didn't calculate those. I just went through the literature that was out there and, and, and kind of used the ones. But, but what was clear is it was either the late March or early April. Nobody is, um, um, has anything later because it's, it's based on they know the, the Hebrew calendar. They know when it, it occurred during that year, those years. So I didn't really do the calculation. I just used different resources or sources. Uh, what sort of earthquakes vary do you have at the Mount St. Helens eruption? Or was that explosive force? Um, I don't recall what the Mount St. Helens was. They have, what they have what's called VEI rating, which is uh, explosive index, volcanic explosive index. Uh, that San Martin was around a four. I think Mount St. Helens might have been a six. And it, that's, they calculate it based on amount of material thrown out. And, and so I don't, I, don't, I don't have that. I could probably look that up, what that eruption was, but I don't have that. How great a distance could a level eight earthquake be felt? Um, I'd have to throw in the attenuation model again because you have to throw that or use that equation and then you calculate out, say, okay, we want to, uh, we put in a level eight earthquake. When you say felt, you're probably down in the Mercalli's two or something like that. So you can fill it quite some distance, but it doesn't have destructive force. And it depends on the attenuation. Do you have any thoughts about your ideas of the um, energies involved in the third Nephite events uh, completely eliminating the viability of the Heartland model or, or not. Again, I, I think I answered that one. And, and like I said, I'm not against any model. It's all fine. I've been to their conference and they're very good people. I just, I just don't agree with them. Uh, the ash cloud of Mount St. Helens roughly flowed west to east. Would a likely volcano need to be located west of the proposed area because similar ash cloud flow would also be west to east due to earth rotation or metro meteorological conditions. I talk about this in the book. Most volcanic eruptions are directional. So you have, most of them just don't go up. A lot of them, they blow out the side. So Mount St. Helens, you had a, 
kind of blow out the side. I mean, it went up too. So pro there's a good probability that those cities that were saying, okay, that was damaged by the pyroclastic flow, they might have been not within some proximity of each other. You would probably expect that. So, you know, I kind of drew this circle. I said it could be anywhere in there, but probably they're going to be grouped because you do have directionality. It's really not based on um, earth rotation. Volcanoes erupt based on pressure buildup. <coughs> And that's why the earthquake triggers them. They have a pressure build up, the earthquake happens, boom, then they blow. The Heartlanders, there's a lot of Heartlanders here, I see, <laughs> contend that the Book of Mormon earthquake volcanic activity occurred in North America. Do we need any geologic evidence that could have happened? Again, the volcano is a, is a kind of a problem. Um, there are some earthquake systems that could generate that, but again, you've got to lay them. You, that's what I'm trying to do is stop, kind of say, hey, we've got this generic discussion. Let's lay things in and see what fits, and then maybe we can better tell, well, you know, where we're at. What side is, okay. I think that's we all. Got this one and one more coming up. Okay. Um, our core samples by the thousands have been taken throughout oil core samples. It should be easy to date volcanic activity in the Gulf due to 2,000 years ago. Comment. Um, you know, the part of the problem is, will your ash deposit on the bottom of the ocean if it, you know, you have ash? They, and oil core sample, who wrote this? Is it a geologist? Yeah, I say, most oil companies don't release data, <laughs> so you can't always tell. So you're, they're not actually available to get I didn't find any that were really available that had any indication that, uh, just that's a good question. I, 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 Already exists in somebody's file. Yeah, you you could like I say, let's say it's San Martin, that could blow out probably close to San Martin, and maybe you get built. You know, as it's, there was enough material. If you have a fine ash flow, that's I mean, honestly, you often unless it's in an area where you get preservation like uh, a lake, oceans don't necessarily preserve a lot of uniform sediments. It kind of moves and moves around. Or a lake where you have this stable environment that you get deposition and it doesn't have to go very far, and th that's where you want to go for sediment if you're trying to do sediment analysis so you don't have things getting turned over and it more or less comes in chronologically. And that's why that marsh deposit actually was useful. Core samples support 1793 eruption, indirect evidence of such an eruption at the time of Christ. Yes, that, that was actually the parameter that I used. I mean, that volcano, the, those volcanoes that I listed would not be listed um, and I talk about that in the book again, unless they had eruptions in the proper time frame. Now, we don't, you cannot tell a volcanic, or unless you have a volcanic eruption that lands on top of a, something that has a date on it. <laughs> and then you have to have another something on top, because all you know is it's later than that. And that actually happened to San Martin. I think that, that erupt, there was one eruption that I think was 31 BC or something landed on a stele. And so, you can say that that eruption occurred afterward. So you can use that, but you, radiometric dating doesn't get you that kind of accuracy. Uh, 